Good morning. Well, I, I just have a couple of comments before we dive into the message. First, I want to say to you women, I want to encourage you to do what uh, Evan encouraged you to do. Uh, last week, this last weekend, we had 750 or so women here. Uh, we have 110 men signed up. You want to know why? Because they just put it off to the last minute. And in this case, I'm saying women, nag them, nag them. Uh, and uh, you notice that blatant attempt to get men's eyes to rise when he said, we have to order enough meat. <laughs> he really would have gotten cheap if he'd added bacon to that, right? Uh, it's going to be great. I hope you come. I hope you get signed up. Uh, we're going to have a good time together. One other announcement. As you know, over the years, Real Life has been very focused on raising children to know the Lord and to reaching them and helping young families. That's why we have sports and, and creative arts and scouting and youth ministry and children's ministry and you name it, parenting classes, marriage classes, uh, all different kinds of ways we're trying to, to help rather than just complain that uh, between 80 and 90% of kids when they graduate from, from a high school leave the church. That's what the stats are. They, they go out of the world. They weren't prepared for it. They get sucked into it. Most of them never to return according to stats nationally. Um, we've tried to, to make a difference. And uh, so we've been involved in um, all the different forms of schooling, uh, public school. Uh, we have some of the most amazing schools here in North Idaho with amazing Christian parents and amazing Christian teachers and administrators on the front lines in the public school. And we celebrate them. We have a lot of partnerships with the public school system because we're allowed to help because of our partnership and support for all these years together. We also have uh, uh, been involved in supporting and encouraging homeschooling. We have so many great parents that uh, are, are supporting and administering to their kids homeschooling. And, and that's become a, a way uh, with all the technology and all the different things that are out there, a, a valid and important way. We also have supported uh, Christian schools in our area. We have kids and parents that work and support the, most of the Christian schools in the area. You know that over the years, we've, we don't believe in having space empty during the week. And so we've been in a partnership with Genesis uh, Preparatory Academy here, where they're leasing our building and space. And, and uh, in the last year, we've actually decided to become more aligned. They're still their own entity, but we're gonna be aligned uh, theologically, doctrinally, lifestyle-wise, and uh, um, not just them, we're going to help other Christian schools as well. But, but uh, we are um, in this position where if you're interested in teaching, you're a teacher uh, and uh, maybe you know somebody who is, and you want to be involved in a school where we're going to make disciples, we're going to, uh, everything we do here at Real Life in some way or fashion or form is going to be intentionally about leading people to uh, be disciples of Jesus. If you're interested in, in helping in that, uh, being involved in that, uh, there's a place for you to, to go to there and, and, and uh, go to the website and, and put in your app or let people know. I mean, here's the deal. You might know somebody from one of these crazy states that they want to get out of there and come on over and help us raise kids who know Jesus. Okay, we'll take them. If they want to know Jesus and help us know Jesus and reach people, then we'll take them. If they don't, they can stay where they are. But, but uh, we are, uh, we're blessed. And, and again, uh, for, for my kids, this is my view of it. I had three different sons. One of them, it didn't matter what school he was going to go to, he was going to flunk. Not because he wasn't smart, but because he was a rebellious little bugger. And now he's a pastor. That makes sense. I had one son that was strong enough to be in the public school system and make a difference. In fact, there are people in our church that because of his influence in the lives of others, they are now Christians and, and serving. And, and uh, my, that son was able to be on the front lines and, and make a big difference. Then I had one son that was a follower when he was younger. Not anymore, but he was. And I had to move him into a Christian school 
so that um, I could protect him. And each of our kids are different, and they might need a different approach. My wife and I, we homeschooled when we were younger until uh, three in three different ages. My wife was like, I'm done with that. But we played a part in all of those avenues. And uh, they're all valid. But, uh, and so we got people in the front lines of all of those things. And if you're, in, if you're doing one of those roles of a teacher in a Christian school or a, a public school or a home school, God bless you. We're praying for you. We're going to work together to reach people and to keep our own instead of uh, reaching lost people and losing our others out of the back door when they get older. We're going we're gonna to do everything we can to fight that. So uh, uh, if you're interested, let us know. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord, thank you for this uh, series. As we dive into your word today, speak to our hearts. Help us to see what you see. Pray that you would guide me as I, as I do this and uh, that your Holy Spirit would be present. In Jesus' name, amen. As we uh, dive into this Standing Firm series, if you've missed any part of it, I want to encourage you to go back and get the, the messages, but also the overtime podcasts that are uh, kind of even going further than the messages. Um, this series is going through the book of First and Second Thessalonians. I hope it's, it, they're not very long uh, little books, uh, letters. Uh, so I, I hope you're reading through that and you're gleaning from that in your quiet time and it's encouraging you. Uh, in the last few weeks, we've given the history of the Thessalonica church. It was started by Paul who had actually been persecuting the first church in Jerusalem, and then he saw the resurrected Christ, and he, he became a Christ follower, an apostle, and then he began to go plant churches. Paul had been in Philippi and uh, started a church there, but then uh, as it started to grow, a rebellion against the church grew up there because it was impacting the economics of that city. Uh, as people stopped uh, idol worship and sacrificing, it was impacting the temples, and so they rallied to, to run Paul out of town, and, and they did. And he goes to Thessalonica after being beaten up in Philippi. He starts to preach there, and they accept the word of the Lord, and the church begins there. And then Paul, after spending some time there, moves on, and uh, he goes to Corinth and some of the other places to do the same work. And then he hears that the same persecution that he had been through, the same persecution that had, that had uh, started in the Jerusalem church is starting to happen in Thessalonica. As people are coming to know Christ, the culture is um, reacting against them. And so Paul is writing this, this, uh, book, this letter to the church uh, and, and he's encouraging them. Um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this is the second letter he wrote them. He, he says this in verse 15, So then, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Stand firm. And hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by prayer, or, or by letter, excuse me. And so he, uh, he's making this point that they need to stand firm, we spoke about this last week, in the teachings of the apostles. Why? Well, because Jesus had said through the, the apostles, the message of the gospel would get out and that they would have the authority to uh, uh, teach and oversee the churches. The, the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the cornerstone Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians. And so the apostles had the authority of the Lord. As you read through First and Second Thessalonians, Paul absolutely says, I'm glad you see these words as they truly are, not the word of men, but the word of God. Now, he's, he consistently says, stand firm and, and uh, hold on and be people that are worthy of the sacrifice that has been given and the kingdom of heaven. This is what he says in 1 Thessalonians 2.11. So let's jump over there real quick. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging and comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Uh, in another place, he says, be worthy of the calling you have received. Now, this makes sense if you understand what the word church means in the Greek. It means the called out ones. The called out ones. Those who have been called and those who have come out of the world to follow Jesus. The church is supposed to be the called out ones. You were called out of the world. 
You're in it, but not of it, Jesus said in John 17. You're called to be different. Now, what does that difference look like? Well, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, he kind of lays out what he's going to say for the rest of the book. And this is all review, but look there real quickly with me. He says in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 3, we remember before our God and Father, he's, he's now encouraging them, your work produced by faith. Your work produced by faith. I know that, uh, that we live in a world that says faith is, is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and died on the cross for you. Uh, and therefore, you believe that. Therefore, you know, you're saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that no man should boast. So, what they do there with that is they go, I can believe this, but don't have to work uh, for the Lord in any sense. Because I believe, I don't need to do anything. James in, in chapter 2, verse 14 says, Faith without works is dead faith, and it can't save you. Romans chapter 1, Paul, who wrote 1 Thessalonians, says you're called to the obedience that comes from faith. So biblical faith actually produces work. You're not saved by your works, but your, your faith produces, if you go to Ephesians 2, same writer, Paul says, you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, so that no man should boast. You're created a new in Christ Jesus for good works, which God planned for you to do before time began. You're saved by grace through faith for good works. He gets, what is that good work? Well, first of all, he made you, he created you, he wants to, he's got things for you to do, but he outlines what good works actually are in the scriptures. The things to do and the things not to do as a believer. So your faith produces works. But then he goes on, he says, so uh, he says, I'm, uh, uh, he says, we remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love. Your labor prompted by love. So he says something here about love, really. Love actually does labor. Love actually does serve. Paul also wrote 1 Corinthians 13. He says, love is patient, love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love, uh, it, love serves, it, it, it ministers, it's not proud or boastful. He's saying that real love isn't necessarily a feeling. It's a decision, a work of God in our hearts to, to say, I will will myself to do what the other person needs regardless of feelings. Now that's important because we live in a culture that says love is a feeling. It's all about love. All you need is love, 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 love. But the Bible actually defines love differently than the world does. If you love somebody, you'll actually affirm them no matter what. For instance, their sexual identity. That you'll actually, you know, you'll just love them. Yes, you love them. You care about them. But love is to desire what is best for them. So if their feelings or emotions or uh, attractions are contrary to, to what God has said in his word, then to affirm that is to affirm something that is hurtful to them, both in their life, in their relationships, and in their eternity with God. In fact, if you go to 1 Corinthians 13, he, starting in verse 4 through verse 8, he says, love does not rejoice with unrighteousness, but it rejoices in the truth. So love doesn't celebrate something that is unrighteous. Why? Because it hurts people. So what you see here is you see two different ideas. Faith that works, love that labors. Now, here's the point. Some people are like, okay, um, uh, love, if I, it's all about love. It's all about love. You've got to love. Now, it's true. Love, God is love. Love is important. But defining what love is, is important. 
God's definition of love. That's important. Because again, the enemy doesn't care if you use good words as long as you don't define them by the good God. Does that make sense to you? So as you understand this, he says, love does good works or literally obeys, uh, uh, obeys God. Faith obeys. Now that, that seems like, okay, is it faith obey or love? It's both. Uh, that's why if you look at uh, Matthew 22, Jesus was asked, and you gotta follow this here, Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? His answer was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says something very important. Verse 40, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. All the law hangs on the command to love. All of the law, thou shalt not murder. I honor the Lord your God. Do I have no other idols before me? Um, it's the Sabbath day. The, the Don't make any graven idols. Obey your parents. Do not lie. Do not uh, commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. All of these things are a protection around love. To define all of this is about loving God and loving others. So when God commands you to do something, it's, he's really telling you to love. Is that making sense? I could start all over again. <laughs> so you have this command here, this, this uh, encouragement to keep doing this and, and endure in doing it. Don't just do it for a short time. That's why he says that hope leads to endurance. Because I, when, it, when, it, uh, when I do these things and it doesn't turn out the way I want it to in relationship, then why do I keep doing it? Because I have hope that God's gonna be involved, that God's gonna get, get, turn this out, that God's got, even if it doesn't on planet earth, eternity is involved. And so he's laying this out for these folks. Now, I wanna, I'm gonna follow the Macedonian church for a minute. We're gonna jump out of First and Second Thessalonians and I want you to turn over to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter eight. 2 Corinthians chapter eight. Now here's why. Paul goes on from Macedonia, the Thessalonica church, goes into Corinth. When he gets to Corinth, the Corinthian church uh, it's not been going through persecution. In fact, where they're living, they're being prosperous. They're having no issues, uh, really, except rather than being pressured from the outside, the enemy has moved to the inside and divided the church. And they're fighting about all kinds of different stuff. They're fighting about which preacher they like to hear more from. They're fighting about what to do at communion. They're fighting about spiritual gifts. There's actually lawsuits amongst believers. These people are uh, not, not living out what the Macedonian church has, the Thessalonica church. And so in the first letter to the Corinthian church, Paul, after starting it and going on to preach somewhere else and start another church, he writes back and he lights them up. I mean, he gives them a swift kick. And uh, now in the second letter, because they responded to the first letter, he takes on a different tone with them. He says, I'm glad I wrote you that letter, though it hurt you, but only for a while. Your sorrow led you to repentance, right? Now he's writing to the Corinthian church about the Thessalonica church. I want you to look at what loving and obeying looks like. Now, first, I want you to notice this. The Thessalonica church didn't have a lot of powerful teachers. They didn't have a lot of amazing stuff going on like the Corinthian church did. Yet the Corinthian church is not having the impact that the Thessalonica church did. These regular everyday people who have been struggling, they're actually making a difference in the whole world. Listen to what he says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 
verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Okay, there's this. this that word is unmerited favor. I want you to know what God has done in Macedonia, in Thessalonica. He says, in the, now I want you to follow me here because this is, this is, this is going to make a lot of sense from a human perspective. He says, in the midst of their very severe trial, they're having overflowing joy. Now remember, up, if you read up above it, it says God is giving them grace, unmerited favor. But then it's saying that they're going through severe trial. That doesn't sound like grace to me. Anybody else going, wait a minute, how is that God's unmerited favor to allow these Christians to go through severe trial? Well, I want you to notice what he says. He says, in the midst of their very severe trial, their overflowing joy, uh, stop right there, I'm gonna come to that next part. They're, God's giving them joy in the midst of their severe trial. And he's calling that grace. Now, one thing I want to mention here, we live in a culture where we think and we want God's grace to mean no trial. In fact, there are all different kinds of prosperity gospels out there and little formulas that people will uh, tell you, like uh, if you do good business practices, you'll always make money. If you tithe, you're always going to have way more than you need. You're going to get rich. If you do, the, we want this formula, and many of you were taught this gospel that says, if you give your life to Jesus, if you give your life to Jesus, then your battle is over. You've crossed the finish line, and now God's job is to bless you and protect all your stuff and, and help your, you know, everything's going to go great. But that's not what Jesus actually said. Jesus said, if you decide to follow me, members of your own household will be your enemies. He said, count the cost of following me. And then he says, listen, foxes have holes. I don't have a place to lay my head. And he said, listen, they persecuted me. How much, they're gonna persecute, persecute you. And in this life, you will face many trials, but take heart, I have overcome the world. See, again, there's not always persecution. In Corinth, there wasn't persecution. In Macedonia, Thessalonica, there was. And I'm guessing that there were seasons when there wasn't in Thessalonica, and later on, there probably was in Corinth. But the promise that, that uh, you know, all your trials and struggles are gonna go away isn't a promise God made not on, on this planet until he returns. I don't know about you, but there are struggles that I've had in my life where I needed people to remind me of that. When my son was doing what he was doing and, and the addiction, and I, I remember when he overdosed and in the coma and all the stuff, and, and, I was, and I've told you this before, I was angry at God and I was, what, what are you doing? And and, uh, and why aren't you doing this and doing that? And, and uh, I remember a brother saying to me, hey, Jim, when did God ever say that if you did the right thing, it would take away your kid's free will? Well, I want him to take away his free will. <laughs> yeah. That promise wasn't made to you. So pray, ask God that if, if there's something that can be done to bring him to his knees, even if it means on his deathbed he comes to know Jesus, pray that. Pray it doesn't take that, but keep praying. But you can't be mad at God about a promise he never made. In fact, he said the opposite. From God's perspective, rather than taking away trials, and again, that doesn't mean that he doesn't take some away. I, I, it doesn't mean that uh, um, he, you know, I believe firmly that the enemy has probably tried to kill anybody who's, who's uh, um, a follower of Jesus. 
and, and God's placed boundaries on what he can do and what, what he can't do. So I, I believe firmly that the enemy can attack and things can happen and God's protected me and protected you. I believe that. But there's a measure at which he allows the world to be the world. And, and his solution is not, if you follow Jesus, everything gets, goes fine. And, and, and so that way everybody will know that you're a Christian because you got wealthy. And then, then you, want, you know, the problem is, is you don't know if they became a Christian because they love God or because they love what God has given. And, and usually when things go well, people don't, uh, I can't tell you many times people have said, pray for me that I get a job. I, they get the job and then I, I don't hit, see them for weeks and it's, where you been? Well, I got a job, so uh, Sunday's my family day now. You had a lot of time to be down here when you didn't have a job. Now you have a job and Sunday and being involved, you're too busy because you've got a job and you don't need God anymore to help you because he did it, which means that he, what he really wanted for you is to spend more time on your job and your hobbies and not do anything to serve the Lord. That's what you believe. Well, I don't really believe that. Yes, you do, because that's what you're doing. You do what you believe. Now, What's going on here is, as believers, when, when we uh, are, are going through good times, that often is the time we become proud. That's always been the case. That's why there's warning after warning in Deuteronomy and across. Be careful when you go into this land, you start eating land you didn't have to grow. You're living in houses that you didn't build. You've got all, that's the time that your heart will become proud and say, I did this with my own hands and you will not praise and worship the Lord your God. And so there's warnings. Listen, God's version of reaching people and strengthening believers is often that he shows the world that we respond differently to the trials and struggles than they do. So think about it this way. What really blew up the uh, early church's work in the New Testament is when Christians were being persecuted and suffering, yet they had joy and they, they sang their way to the crucifixion cross. For the people at that time, they're like, well, they're not lying. They're not getting anything for this. They're not afraid of what we're afraid of. They see something that, that we don't see, and it impacted people. And so here, Paul is saying, God's allowing the trial, but he's giving you joy in the midst of it. That doesn't mean I'm happy with the circumstances. It means I rejoice that my biggest problem has been solved by Christ already, that there is something coming for me, that God is involved in this. He can work it out for good, that even if, if it goes bad here and I end up dying, my, my eternity is secured in Christ Jesus, and so they just live differently. Now, notice what it says next here. It says, in the midst of their very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, hold on, now they, they don't have much, welled up in rich generosity. Normally, poverty doesn't lead to generosity. Poverty leads to, why am I in this situation? What, why are you doing, I can't really help. My amount of money doesn't really matter. My amount of service doesn't really help because I'm just small and I, I, I don't have enough. And if God gave me more, then I would be more and I would do more. And you know, you know, this, these people, their severe poverty resulted in generosity. How, how does that happen? How do you have joy and generosity when you're in poverty and in trial, because the world isn't all there is. These people are standing firm in the truth. Their, their faith is leading to work and their love is leading to labor and their, their hope is leading to perseverance and, they, and they're doing what they, what they can with what they have. Notice what he says here. He says, uh, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and it beyond their ability, entirely of their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Now, what's going on? What's he talking about? Well, they're not only caring for each other like they did in Acts 2. You know, they were selling their possessions and gifts, goods to give whoever had need. But, but Jerusalem is really under fire right now. 
Paul is actually asking the Corinthians to join with the Macedonians to to send support to Jerusalem because in Jerusalem, the the disciples are even being chased and pursued and killed. the, the, The severe trial they've got in Jerusalem is even worse than it was in Macedonia. So these guys, Paul is saying, hey, let's go help. Let's help each other. Let's go help. And he's saying this, that they pleaded and begged for the opportunity to give. Now, what was the, the Macedonians' ability to give going to be as much as the Corinthians' ability to give? No. But it isn't about the number, it's about the heart. If you remember, Jesus celebrated the greatest giver in the New Testament was a widow who gave the smallest amount of money, but she gave everything she had. And Jesus said she gave more than all the Pharisees and everybody else. These people were like, hey, what we have, we'll use for the Lord and we'll we'll trust that God will supply our needs in the future. So, you know, this isn't all I have. I'm gonna give my time, my energy, my effort. I'm gonna give, I'm a part of the kingdom of heaven and we have a kingdom mission we've been given and yes it's to reach macedonia and yes it's to reach and minister to to, uh to jerusalem but we're a part of the kingdom of heaven and we are supplied by the king and he gives different people different amounts but he expects for all of us to be a part of his agenda in fact, if you go into uh, to uh, First Thessalonians, he says, because of your faith, it's now ringing out from you to the whole region. Your faith is becoming known to the whole region. Paul doesn't say that to Corinth, by the way. Oh, oh he says, oh, your attitude is ringing out as you have lawsuits amongst each other, as you fight about all, all different kinds of stuff. Oh yeah, that's having an impact. But this little church in Macedonia, in Thessalonica, these these folks over there, they're changing the world. It isn't about the amount of money or the skill sets. It's about the heart. People saying yes to God and being a part of what he's doing. Yes, God. And God uses that. I mean, Paul actually writes, hey, not many of you were were owners of businesses. You were wealthy. No, you were mostly slaves at the beginning, destitute people. But God takes the weak things of the world to shame the wise. The wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. And he says, listen, the early church, regular, ordinary, unschooled people who are absolutely committed to the agenda of God, to trusting in Jesus and following him, they stood firm and not only held their numbers in the, in the uh, persecution and the trials, they took ground from the enemy and the world heard about Jesus. As you start to unpack this, Paul says, this is what standing firm looks like. He's actually using people that the Corinthians would have thought were like, you know, we have way better teachers, way better preachers. We have way, we have better skilled people. We have more talents and abilities. We have better knowledge. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. You can know all mysteries and speak in the tongues of angels and of men, but if you have not love, you're a clanging cymbal, a noisy gong. You're just noisy. But these people aren't ringing out noise, they're ringing out clarity. And the world is responding. They're standing firm. Well, they're not just standing firm in the positive sense, they're being told to stand firm in the negative sense. Here's what I mean by that. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, Paul is saying, listen, the culture you're living there in Thessalonica and in Corinth as well was a uh, a sexually perverse culture. They were worshiping their gods through sex. Um, It would be like Las Vegas on steroids at night in these cultures. 
And um, here's what Paul writes to the Thessalonians. Listen to chapter four, verse one. As for the other matters, brothers and sisters, so you've been ringing out, you've been giving, you've been serving, you've been doing these things. You've been doing in the positive sense, the right things, keep doing that. Now he says, not, don't just do these positive things. There's, there's certain things you're to avoid. You're to get rid of. It's not to be amongst you. It's not to be a part of your, your gatherings, who you are as a people. Listen to what he says. As for the other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. How many of you in here want to live in order to please God? As in fact, you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there, there's he's saying, listen, this is how you ring out. This is the positive sense, your labor of love, your faith that works, your endurance that, because of hope. He says now... Verse three, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. So you were declared righteous, saved. Now the Holy Spirit comes in and now you're in the process of sanctification. You're becoming holy or set apart for God. And he says this, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Stop right there, avoid. That word, uh, that's almost too timid in, in English. Hey, avoid the, uh, uh, when you're going home today, avoid the, uh, the, the work they're doing over here on the road. That's different than saying forbid. I forbid you to go that way. In this word here, it means stand completely apart from, have nothing to do with it. Avoid sexual immorality. Now let's stop right there. What is sexual morality? Sexual uh, appropriateness, rightness. They're the boundaries that God has placed on sex. They're the boundaries that God has placed around sex. Sex is to be between a man and a woman. Sex is to be only in the context of marriage. Uh, fornication, sex before marriage, adultery, sex with somebody other than your spouse, homosexuality, pornea, pornography, uh, not uh, actually having the physical act, but, uh, but, but being involved in participating in somebody else committing immoral acts. He says, abstain from it, avoid it, get away from it. Let it have no In fact, he says in another place, don't even touch the clothing that's been stained by, by sexual immorality. Don't even, don't even go there or near it, stay away from it. He goes on, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans. So he says, listen, uh, going back to love, love is an act of the will that to do what is best for the other person. He says, the culture is obsessed with passion and lust. That is a desire not to love the other person, but to use the other person to satisfy my own proclivities, my own desires, my own attractions. He says the Christian doesn't live that way. And then he goes on, he says, uh, he says these, not like a passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that is in, in this matter, no one, listen, and that is in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. So now he's talking about Christians within the family of God. He says that you are wronging your brother or sister and taking advantage of them rather than loving them and supporting them and caring about what's best for them, that you're actually living like the pagans do who want what you want and you're using them. Again, some people wanna, wanna act as though uh, pornography is, is acceptable because you're not actually going through with it, except that if you ever thought about the father of, of a little girl who, or boy who is doing that. Now, I, I know we have a polluted version of fatherhood today in some regards, so some fathers may not be brokenhearted about one of their children. Some mothers may not be brokenhearted about one of their children doing that for money. 
But our heavenly father is a good father who sees that person that he created lost as they are. He wants to save them. He doesn't want them to be used for other people's uh, passions and lust. He wants to protect them. He cares about them. And so if you think about pornography in the sense that, that that's somebody that God wants to save from that and you're contributing to what's happening there. And he says, no. He says, the Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. So for these, these folks that are saying, okay, we're gonna love, we're gonna care about people, but secretly we're gonna come and be involved over here. And if I love people over here, then, then using them over there. No, he says, no, loving people, laboring for people, caring for people in a godly sense means that you abstain from, from allowing the culture to shape you into, into a broken, sinful, twisted form of, of what sex is all about about and what it's for. And so he says, here's, here's the positive actions I want you to take. And these negative things that the world weaves into everything. I mean, you don't even have to, you could be on your, your internet uh, doing a Google search on the early church fathers and up comes something on, on your, they, they're coming at you and, and you have to go, wait a minute. No, I abstain from that. I say no to that. Now, again, if you've given in to that, or if you failed in this way, we have a God who accepts uh, us. And when we come confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And, he, and yes, it, 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 when we come to Jesus, there's a repentance. And, and now, though we struggle with things, we're like, no, that's not, I, that's not my heart. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leaves no regret. Worldly sorrow leads to death. There's a difference. Worldly sorrow doesn't lead to repentance. It's just, I'm terrible. I'm bad. I can't believe I do this. Worldly sorrow leads to death. Godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. And when we come and we failed and we're like, Lord, forgive us, he's there, but there's a change of heart in us. And he says, listen, live in this world in a culture that it's always been sexual, folks, always been. He says, we don't live like the rest of the world. We're not animals. We're not beings of mere instinct. We're not an evolutionary process where our attractions can't be controlled and shouldn't be controlled. No, we're broken because of sin and we have attractions and we have things that, that uh, are, are polluted forms of the perfect that we were given, but they've been broken down and, and twisted. And now with God's help, we, we don't have to be under its in slavery to those things. And so we fight those things and that a believer in Christ says, Yes to loving God and yes to loving others and yes to being somebody who stands firm in the teachings that are both positive, do this and don't do that. And when we do, we participate in the amazing things, that little church in Macedonia, in Thessalonica, made a difference in their world because they stood firm. And we can do that too, because we have the same God. It's my prayer that we'll stand firm in the teachings that we have been given, knowing that they represent the truth as given by the Lord Jesus himself and by the power of the Holy Spirit coming from the Father, God, heart of God to us. But you get to choose where you stand firm. You get to choose it. I pray you do today. If you've never accepted Christ, we hope today you'll go, yep, I've blown it, but so has everybody else in here. We've just come to Jesus and said, forgive us, Lord. Be our savior and our king. Thank you for coming for us. Change us. For those of you who have made that decision, communion is a time to remember you gave your life to him after he gave his life for you. And that changes everything. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are. Guide us today in Jesus' name, amen.